I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about um, what's happening. Uh, there's a disturbing there's a disturbing trend with the president, and um, it's crossed a line. And I don't think that we're going to have time to be able to get this out to the American people before the election um, because the press is of no help. And I'm going to try my best to explain this all to you, but things are coming out now fast and furious. And, gosh, I shouldn't use that one. They're coming out quickly. Um, and you need to try to listen and get your friends to listen next door because this isn't about politics. This truly is about the future of the country because we are in grave, grave danger. We've had presidents in the office before. We've had good presidents. We've had bad presidents. And some days, someday we'll have female presidents and male presidents and black presidents and Asian presidents, but they're all people. And sometimes people are good, sometimes people are bad. But it is for us, the American people, to decide which the good ones are and which the bad ones are, and then correct the errors of our ways, ourselves. Since I have been um, alive, uh, in, and that I remember on presidents, we've had two major um, scandals. Let's say, let's, uh, no, we've had three. We've had Nixon with Watergate, where he sat at this desk and says, it's important to know if your president is a crook. You have to be able to trust the American president. And we couldn't in the end. And he looked in the camera and he lied. The other one was the Iran-Contra scandal with Reagan. But I, I happen to believe the president didn't know on that one. Maybe he did. I don't think he did. And then there was the Lewinsky scandal where he looked again in the eye. I did not have sex with that woman. Now, the first, the first one and the last one, you can say, well, that was just about politics. That was just about sex. The middle one was about hostages. But the truth matters. And nobody wants to think of somebody who sits in this desk. I, you know what? To heck with this desk. I don't think anybody wants to ever think that anyone that they know could be so, such a sociopath that they don't care, that they can actually look you in the eye. How many times have you ever had anybody lie to you? And they look at you in the eye and they lie to you and then you find out they're lying and you're like, the guy looked me in the eye. How does he even do that? Nobody wants to think about that as a friend. And they don't want to think about that as a president because it carries other implications when it's somebody who sits behind this desk. In the first case and the last case, at least, uh, it was undeniably true that the president broke our trust. He lied. And he looked us in the eye. But in both of those, as the old catchphrase goes, when Clinton lied, no one died. We have a president now who is engaging in that kind of stuff, and it's, you can make the excuse for it, well, it's politics and this kind of stuff happens. No, not like this. But you could also say that nobody's dying on this one. Our president, I think, likes to call people liars, but he is apparently disturbed when others do so. I want to show you the president in the debate. Watch. Okay, we're not getting audio here. But this is, this is when the president is talking to him, Mitt Romney, and he's saying, M Mitt Romney, that, that's, that's, not, that's not right. You wanted the company to go bankrupt. And the president interrupts him several times. And then he finally says, look it up. Just look it up. The president does. Look it up. And Mitt Romney says, please do. It's easy to verify. It's very easy to verify. We did look it up. The op-ed that Mitt Romney was talking about was in the New York Times. And here it is. 
it says exactly what Romney claims he said, not what Barack Obama. Now, you can say at this time, okay, well, he, you know, misremembered. But it was clear that Obama was wrong, and even MSNBC called him out on it. Here's MSNBC on this particular point of the debate. Let's bring in Lori Robertson, who is the uh, managing editor of factcheck.org. Good morning. Good morning. So who was right in that exchange over the auto bailout? Well, Romney was right. Uh, Obama was wrong. Uh, indeed, if you look back at Romney's 2008 op-ed, uh, he argued against the bailout, but he argued for a managed bankruptcy with uh, federal guarantees for post-bankruptcy financing. So uh, a federal loan guarantee for the post-bankruptcy okay, financing it. would indeed be... So here's uh, MSNBC verifying that the president was wrong. Now, any normal human being, when caught... If you're in an election, you don't, you just like, I, and you don't mention it ever again. But let's say for the sake of argument, let's give Obama the benefit of the doubt. He was fed bad information. He misspoke. He was thinking of something else. But then the next day when everyone verifies that he was wrong, and this is not the first time they verify that he was wrong, he goes on TV and his campaign advisor should say, Mr. President, you can't go on the campaign trail and say this anymore because you were wrong. Got it? But he goes out instead, this president, onto the campaign trail, hours after all of the fact checkers call him out, after MSNBC calls him out, and he's in Ohio, and he starts to mock and again call Mitt Romney the liar for this very fact. Watch. If you say that you love American cars during a debate, you're a car guy, but you wrote an article titled let Detroit go bankrupt. You definitely have a case of Romnesia. Yo, last night Governor Romney looked you right in the eye, looked me in the eye, tried to pretend that he never said let Detroit go bankrupt. Okay, stop. Tried Listen to this. The president even knows how important it is to look a man in the eye. Come in. This is an important thing. When a man looks another man in the eye and says, I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. Look it up. It's the truth. Look it up yourself. It's the truth. Now, if I said that to you, and I was proven by everyone that I was lying to you, you could say, Glenn just made a mistake. He was thinking something else. But then when you know everyone has said it's a lie, and I get on the next day and say, you know what? <laughs> Look it up. It's the truth. I either have deep psychological problems or I, I, don't, I don't even know. I, I was going to say you're insane, but that's the same, isn't it? You, there's something wrong. So here's the president saying... Romney looked, looked, looked us into the eye, looked you into the eye, looked me into the eye. And he knows 100% what he's about to tell them is not true. And he's out there standing with the good people of Ohio, looking them in the eye and lying to them again. I, I know America does not want to hear that their president is a liar. Their president, they have to know if their president is a crook. They have to know. But this president does not care about telling the truth. He doesn't even express a hint of shame when the press exposes a lie. Now, this is a disturbing trend, but again, let's back up. This is just about politics. This is just about election. They all lie. That's what your friends will say. Lewinsky, it was just about an affair. No one was dying here. Okay. I would counter when you are going for this seal. I mean, personally, you can't lie. I'm a guy who lost my honor. Um, I'm a guy who built my life on a lie. And back in 1995, I had lost everything. And I realized the only thing I really, that truly was mine, the only thing worth value was my word. And only until you've lost everything do you understand how every single lie matters. It does. Don't ever tell anything but the truth. The God's honest truth, so help you God. Because when you're in this office, it matters.
It matters because the whole world needs to trust. When the American president says something, when the American people say something, they have to know we can trust it. Now, how can you possibly trust anything that anyone ever says? How can you trust that the president is, is not going to raise taxes on you if he lie to you to get to the office? When he says, I'm going to cut the deficit in half and then racks up record deficits or won't rein in out-of-control spending, what good is his word? Especially on issues that really matter. The Romney op-ed claim demonstrates his unrepentant ability to lie, and there's a ton of those that are riddled with this president. But people will tell you that's just about politics. I'm taking a different tone with you tonight because what I'm about to show you is not about politics at all. And you will only know I mean this if you watched me when I was at CNN and I said you can impeach George W. Bush on these things um, because these things, there's something very, very wrong on the border. Or when Romney gets into office and I tell you the same kinds of things about Mitt Romney if he would make these kinds of mistakes. This mistake I've never seen a president make before. But I beg that you, I hope, I pray, that you have enough credibility with your friends and your neighbors that you can bring them this information and share with them and show them that this is not about politics. This is about, this is about the future of our country on this one. The president has lied about the attack that killed the ambassador and three other Americans. And if we can't get him to tell us the simple truth at the very beginning, there is something very wrong. And at, very, at the very best, it's a, a, just a very deep callousness that I don't think I've ever seen from a sitting president before. This man is putting American lives in danger, and he doesn't seem to care about the consequence of his own action. He doesn't care about um, the lies that he's telling. Why? The Libya story hasn't passed the smell test with me from the very beginning, but it keeps getting worse. I'm going to show you the latest news today. We know now that the White House was told, they were informed within two hours after the tax began on Ambassador Stevens and his personnel, that they were indeed planned attacks by a known terrorist group. Now, here are, here are the emails. These came out last night after the broadcast. There are three emails. These went to just about everybody at the State Department, everybody at the Pentagon, and you'll see all the addresses, and also the White House Situation Room. Email number one came in at 4.05 p.m., the subject, U.S. Diplomat, uh, diplomatic mission in Benghazi under attack. The regional security officer reports the diplomatic mission um, is under attack. Uh, Twenty armed people fired shots. Explosions have been heard as well. Ambassador Stevens, who is currently in Benghazi, and four comm personnel are in the compound safe haven. The 17th of February militia is providing a security support. That is really important to remember that. The operations center will provide updates as available. Email number two. This one came in at 4.54 p.m. Embassy Tripoli reports firing a U.S. diplomatic mission in Benghazi has stopped. The compound has been cleared. Response team is on site attempting to locate comm personnel. Email number three, 607. Embassy Tripoli reports the group claimed embassy on Facebook and Twitter has called for an attack on Embassy Tripoli. Now, these are three, these are three emails that have gone to, this was at the Situation Room. The president was scheduled to be upstairs at 5 o'clock in his Oval Office meeting with the Secretary of Defense. Everyone had these emails, everyone. These emails were accompanied with video and links to be able to see everything live as it was happening. It makes it very, very clear. This was a terrorist attack conducted by a terrorist organization. There's nothing in here about a YouTube video. So why was Susan Rice and the others in the administration running around the media for weeks claiming that the best information available was that it was a spontaneous crowd? There, there's nothing about that. In these or in any of these documents, that are now coming out. None of them. So 
who told Susan Rice and the president that this was a reaction to a YouTube video? Let me tell you the, the best information we have at present. First of all, there's an FBI investigation which is ongoing, and we look to that investigation to give us uh, the definitive word as to what transpired. But putting together the best information that we have available to us today, okay. our current assessment Stop. is that what happened in Benghazi was, in fact, initially a spontaneous. Okay. The uh, best information that they've been able to put together. We have their best information. There's nothing about it. There's nothing about it. The three, the three emails, the cables that they got, don't say anything about that. They, they attach the blame to a terrorist organization. So who told the president about the YouTube video? Where is any of that information? If the president wanted to be cautious with the facts, then he would run with these. Because he had not only these three, but that whole stack over there, and 12 reports within six hours from, uh, I believe, 12 different agencies, all saying terrorist attack. So why would he go for the video and then indict a filmmaker with no evidence? Honestly, the video part of this lie is the least important part of it, because that, that part is important, but it leads you down the road. Is, is, the, is he doing the work of the Muslim Brotherhood's project? Because he knew full well, within two hours, this was an organized terrorist attack. Why would, he, why would he choose to say we should curb freedom of speech? Why? And here's where it gets really disturbing. Why would he choose not to send in a quick response force? Now, we have bases all over the world. But this is why we have bases. We have a base in Sicily. This is about 45 minutes. What a what a, a quick reaction reaction force does is this is what this is what it's made for. If something goes down, they grab their equipment, they grab their men, get them on planes, and get to the situation. They're right there. Why were they not dispatched to Benghazi? Why were people in the Situation Room standing around watching our people get killed? Help could have been there within the hour. The attacks were monitored in real time by the State Department, by the Pentagon, by the CIA, and in the Situation Room. How could they have all of this information and not do anything? Why was there a drone flying over Benghazi? Drones just don't happen to be floating around random cities all over the world. Who ordered the drone? Where did it come from? When was it ordered? Why was it ordered? On the anniversary of 9-11, when security concerns were so high, why was the ambassador anywhere near the most dangerous city, possibly in the Middle East? You know, it's frustrating because I blew my stack today. Because um, there are times that I think, if I were in the hallways of New York, but that is the wrong way to think of it. We are on a long-term mission here to rebuild the networks because the networks are failing. They are failing and they are, they are, they're just not telling you the truth and I don't know why. But we have, we have two weeks now. We were the first to bother to look into this. We, it bothered me. We reported on September 17th that Stevens was there on a weapons mission. Now, this was my gut at the time, but there were some things that I knew. That was a CIA safe house. The guys who died were CIA agents. They were looking for weapons. This is something to do with gun running. That was my gut on September 17th. And I said, listen, this, I want you to know this is my gut, but this is, what is, this is what's happening. Now the administration's efforts to support the Libyan and Syrian rebels is beginning to be reported by the media, but nobody's tying it all together. Obama chose to help the radicals and the Islamists. They needed to find somebody to broker the weapons deals with these rebel armies, these really bad, bad guys. And I believe Ambassador Stevens was that person. The ambassador was a CIA agent. If you look at the timeline of Stevens' evening on 9-11, Remember, this is not a consulate building. This is not an embassy building. This is a safe house. And the only safe houses we have are CIA safe houses. So on the most dangerous day of the year, in one of the most dangerous cities in the world, the ambassador is there with no protection at a CIA safe house. Benghazi time. Look at the, look at the timeline. 
at Benghazi, in Benghazi time, at what is it, 650, 654 Benghazi time, one of the agents, Sean Smith, was on an internet gaming message board. He posted online, we're in real trouble, assuming we don't die tonight, we'll talk later. I just saw one of our police, quotation marks, that guard the compound taking pictures. Well, there's a couple of things here. Why was he posting this, a CIA agent, on a gaming website? The gaming website's not a CIA front. But I believe this is a place where he said, listen, if I'm in trouble, I will let you know on this site. He did. We're in trouble. He gives them information. There's somebody taking pictures, and it's the guards. Remember the guards. Remember that part. He, he says the police, with air quotes. Why? That indicates sarcasm. The police. Well, as you're about to see, there's a very good reason for that sarcasm. I'll explain in a minute. At 7.30 p.m., a mere 34 minutes after po uh, Smith posts that and says, hey, there's trouble. I just saw something. Something's going on. People are watching the exits. Ambassador Stevens, he takes in another meeting, this time with the Turkish Council General. Now, what do you suppose Turkey would be meeting with the American ambassador in Benghazi about at that time? What's bizarre is he comes in while the, they're under threat. They know inside the compound they're under threat. And here comes the Turkish ambassador. Why would the ambassador put the, the guy from Turkey in jeopardy? Remember Turkey. 8.30 p.m. Stevens walks the Turkish visitor to the main gate and returns back to the residence. The Turkish consul general leaves without incident. No riots, no protests, no, nothing happens to that guy. That's strange, isn't it? They're watching the place. Here comes the guy from Turkey, he comes in and out. What did they talk about? Can somebody tell us what that meeting was about? 9.40 p.m., the assault begins, and the sound of gunfire erupts, and an American diplomat security agent looking at closed-circuit TV screens in the operations center saw armed men swarming through the compound. He hit the alarm and started shouting, attack, attack, over the loudspeaker. The ensuing fight lasted over seven hours until the break of dawn. Okay. The president was watching this in the Situation Room. And if he wasn't, why weren't you, Mr. President? You were there. You were at the White House. Why weren't you downstairs watching this live feed? Why was the Turkish general, why was the general counsel allowed to leave the compound by these rebels? It was about to be assaulted. Presumably, the attackers were, were getting into position. Did they wait for the Turkish general counsel to leave? Is he part of it? Is Turkey part of it? Who in their right mind would have a friendly meeting with a U.S. ambassador under heightened security risk in Benghazi? Which brings me to this. If you turn to page 38, this is, these are all the documents we have uncovered. Documents here. This one is um, unclassified. This is a brief from the State Department dated September 4th. In this document, they point out that Benghazi has been placed on maximum security. It talks about, you know, public comments uh, from senior in, uh, interior ministry officials August 29th regarding blah, 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 blah. You don't need all this stuff. You know what this means? The city of Benghazi put a maximum alert out. They told all of their police, you've got to stay on extra duty. You've got to watch everything. That's what, that's what this means. In response to our long-standing request, okay? That happened September 4th. Why would our ambassador on September 11th have somebody important come to visit him? Why would we not have an aircraft carrier presence in the Mediterranean? We have plenty of time. We have plenty of warning. You'll see they were over here getting ready for exercises, CV-6965. Those are aircraft carriers. And they're getting ready for these, uh, these exercises a week later on Iran. But there's nobody in the Mediterranean. And there's all this information, document after document, something's coming. Here's the problem with all of this. All of this stuff is just loose pieces. And when you read, and the New York Times is amazing to me. Because the New York Times is actually, they are reporting some of these things. They are. But if you're a puzzle, are you a puzzle person? I hate these things. My wife loves them. You got all these puzzle pieces. And the press does this all the time. They do this. They, they don't put the puzzle pieces together. 
And I, I think it's because when you do, you begin to see something very disturbing. You have to look at each piece and you have to put it all together. And you're like, oh, look, look, it's blue. And they'll, they'll, they'll spend five minutes on TV saying, look at this, it's, it's blue. It's blue. It's very important that this is blue. And in other news, it's green. It's green and it's very important that it's green. They never put any of this stuff together. They never say, I wonder what picture it's starting to make. It makes the New York Times, I guess, feel better that they reported the gun running, the aircraft carriers, uh, the uh, Turkish uh, general counsel, but they never put it all together. We did. And the picture is frightening. And you need to share it with your friends.